And he said, yeah, I think, quote unquote, I'm the only one who knows. Yeah. Well, isn't that an admission of guilt? You have a missing person and somebody says, I'm the only one who knows. To me, that's like an admission of guilt. Right. Oh, well, if you know where she is, then... Right. Tell me where the fuck she is. Yeah. Everybody, welcome to another episode of Cities of Blood podcast. I'm Phil Lasaro. And I'm Alexis Terevko. And uh, welcome back. Last week we uh, took the car out for a ride and tried a, a bit of a mobile episode. I hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, it's sorry. my favorite episode so far. I, I dig it too. We got to do another one. Only um, I've got to find a better mount for the second GoPro, the outside one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Make the quality a little bit better. It was behind the windshield, and because of the glare. Um, it wasn't as good as it could have been. I barely noticed. I want to switch over to something else real quick. The, the Amber Geiger case that uh, just recently, you know, she got 10 years. Yeah. There was a, a guy named Joshua Brown who testified on behalf of, uh, of the prosecution. Anyways, he's been killed. He was, he was murdered. Yeah. <clears throat> Everybody automatically started jumping to conclusions that it was some type of retaliation, right? It's by like law enforcement, by it. law enforcement, you know, because Amber Geiger was a police officer. Um, just absolute absurdity. They, they have watched way too many bad cop shows. Seriously, I mean, come on, you know this. It's um, that whole thing was such a tragic uh, set of circumstances that happened with that. And an embarrassment on, on, on any any police force. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, yeah. The, the, the police force, the city. Yeah. So they just want, you know, to let the story go away, mm -hmm. which it never will. This is one of those stories that's never going to go away. Well, you have to think, too, that in what? Five years she'll get parole, maybe? Ah, dude, I'm thinking it's more like two or three. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm willing to bet she's going to do... Because you're going to figure they're going to give her a year served for... From when she got arrested till she got convicted. Yeah. So that's uh, either a year or two years of time, because, you know, double time. And then she'll do, she'll do maybe two years in the jail and be good and get let out and do six or seven years probation. Yeah. Move that, uh, that little tripod off of there, what do you think? I think that's what I'm seeing. No, it was more the other thing. No, oh. no big deal. The um, well, like you, like we said, like I just said, it's a tragic, tragic case. And um, I here, here's my my. Now we know his the victim's brother uh, made the statement that he didn't even want her to go to jail. It was it him who gave her the hug? Yeah, he's the same one. And then he then he offered her a hug uh, in the courtroom. In the courtroom. And they had a long emotional hug, which I guess would ex be expected. And then the judge hugged her. Oh, wow. Well. Which I thought was a little strange. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that's a little bit odd. But do you think that there's going to come down to a point when she does get parole and he is the one that says, I want her to get out of jail? I think that could very well happen. I think because they're at parole hearings, family members mm -hmm. are invited to those hearings. I believe if her brother goes to that hearing, he probably will recommend her get her. I mean, if he was able to, to cross the courtroom uh, and give her a hug like that, which I think the judge should have just let it go at that. I thought that was such a huge, powerful thing. Why has mm -hmm. it got to follow up with a judge giving her a hug? Be yeah. Right. It's just kind of, you know. But um, but I think you're absolutely right. I, 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 he already obviously has forgiven her if he can give her a hug. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure he probably will attend that parole hearing and uh, and ask for her release. That's probably what you said. Two or three years in would be her first parole. Hearing. So what we're in 2009. I would say she'll be in on the streets of Dallas or some city if she can't necessarily be in Dallas. Yeah. Uh, by by January of 2023. So that's three years and a few months. Now, meanwhile, back to Joshua Brown, who testified um, on behalf of the prosecution. Mm -hmm. 
uh, he everybody thought everybody jumped to not everybody but a lot of people jumped to conclusions thinking that this the police force might have had something to do with his recent murder turns out uh it was a drug deal gone wrong and there are three suspects one of them is in custody already uh the person the perp in custody is a uh, a named jaquirius mitchell I know. It sounds like a made-up name. I, uh, Jaquirius. I think it's J-A-C-Q or J-A-Q-U-E-R-I-O-U-S. And, um, yeah, well, his his uncle, so th- this is... Uh, his, That's a hell of a name. Right, his, his uncle's name is Michael Diaz Mitchell, and he's still uh, on the loose. They're still trying to, to find him, um, I believe. And Thaddeus Charles Green... So right now, the police are looking for Thaddeus Charles Green and Michael Diaz Mitchell, and they have Jaquarius Mitchell in custody, and this is on the murder of Joshua Brown for a drug deal gone wrong. had nothing to do with um, retaliation for a verdict against a police officer. And then going back to saying just what, what part in the city or what part of the responsibility has the city taken if she really was a, a, like an overworked employee? Well, and I didn't watch the trial, but I'm assuming his door was unlocked, and that's how she was able to just walk right in. Yeah, I mean that's what I, I, I read part of, uh, like the transcripts from the trial, yeah. and it, it that's what I the indication is that that's what happened. Because otherwise, it would be. It was like one of those things where, and you see it in the movies, the door was cracked open a little bit, and that's why she pulled her weapon. Well, and it's okay. So his door was open. That I guess I could, it's believable then. Yeah. The part I was thinking, and I was jumping to another con- not another conclusion, but thinking another possible scenario is that when I was in the Marine Corps, I had uh, another corporal that worked with me, and he uh, he lived in an apartment complex with his, his wife and his daughter, and one day he's like sitting at home uh, washing his car, right. And, uh, you know, his wife and kid are gone. And so it's hot and he's washing the car and everything. He goes to run inside his apartment real quick to grab a drink. And he opens the door and there's three people sitting in the living room watching TV. And he thinks, oh, my God, I walked into the wrong apartment. He says, oh, I'm sorry. Turns around, shuts the door. Then goes, wait a goddamn minute. Turns around, goes back in. It's his apartment. And there's three people sitting on his fucking sofa watching, you know, television. And he, they were they were all mentally disabled. Oh. And what happened was in his apartment complex, there were a lot of mentally disabled people that were staying there living on their own. And they gave they gave them all master keys because they would didn't know the difference between keys and shit. Like it was that, you know, they were that disabled. Yeah. And so they would just give them master keys, a key that would literally work to any lock in the apartment complex. Oh. And so they had keys to his apartment. And they walked right in. And I mean, it was, and he's yelling at him, and he's, he's trying to point out pictures on the wall of him and his wife and his kid. He's like, Does that look like you? That's, you know, and he was a funny dude. Uh. <laughs> that's a true story. And so that's what I was thinking. I was like, maybe, You know, could it be that in that apartment complex, somehow her key worked in his lock you know but I, I like i said i didn't watch the case it was probably more simple like you said where his door was just unlocked she was worn out after working a double walked in and completely freaked out and shot somebody in the dark right yeah well I, terrible crime i mean terrible accident a tragedy right i do believe it was it would have to be. I mean, otherwise there would be a connection between. I, at the first, I was thinking when it first came, was there a connection where they boyfriend and girlfriend? See, that, and I mean, I lover? did was like, oh, they must be like lovers. And then when that came out, that they barely knew each other. It, it just sounds so absurd, crazy. Sorry about. It's that. one of those. It's almost one of those things that's written for television. Truly, even television producers were probably like, "This isn't believable." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we've written enough of these shows. Yeah. So. Talked about the uh, the Amber Geiger case. I wanted to go over something that uh, that I talked to you a little bit earlier, and this was uh, okay. So I want to lead into it with this. 
you've heard about the the missing four one one, right? Uh, it's David Palladius, the book. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, now that's people missing from national parks. Yeah. And then reappearing, and there's something kind of eerie and mysterious about those cases. Definitely, you know, aliens. Not, I'm not going to say supernatural, you know, shape shifting Bigfoots, whatever. But it is interesting, very eerie, the way some of the people are found. Yeah. We've got something a bit more sinister and uh, not nearly as mysterious that uh, we just came across. And this was a staggering number that uh, up to almost 6,000 Native American women are missing. Yeah. And only two, less than 200 of them are actually in the National Missing Persons Database. Yep. And I, you know, it's funny was not funny. I always say that it's the wrong thing to say in this like topic, but weird. The, yeah, the when I on the program we had we watched when it said six thousand. Yeah, I rewound it because I thought I misheard him. Yeah, because it's such a ridiculous. I thought number. okay, six hundred. I could I could have I could have accepted. But when he said six thousand, I was like. You've got to be kidding me. Well, that's why I put the comparison is that yeah. this this tops the number that the, the missing four one one. Oh, well, yeah, and it's here we go again. Hmm, it's Wait. gone. I think it's something to do with that. That was so weird. But and then uh, to only have two hundred of them registered in the National Missing Persons Database. That's now. This seems to be <clears throat> maybe a definitely a partially a cultural thing seems to be happening here but also something that's going on with the fact that these crimes are happening on a, uh, a reservation well and that was the thing they said they mentioned in the article was that it's the federal government the the tribe the, tr- the tribal, tribal government, government and then the bureau of indian affairs yeah. so it's basically three separate governments that have to work together and none of them are doing anything and like the bureau the bureau of indian affairs um well, I'm not, I'm not sure the Bureau of Indian Affairs. I didn't realize that they were equipped for um, for like murder investigations, for example. Yeah. Now, at that point, you would think it would be the FBI, but the FBI is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, mm-hmm. and you, you're dealing on a um, a reservation. A reservation is another nation. And that's and that's like the thing. He's the one of the the officers that was the the chief of that department. It stopped. Um said that the land that he manages the 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 whatever the how many square acres was he has it's him and 16 other officers and if they were any other law enforcement agency in the in the country there'd be at least 55 officers so imagine imagine that you have a police force that's basically a third of what it should be it's like a barney fife Type situation that and uh, the, because of the because it's uh, another sovereign nation, mm-hmm. you have the jurisdictional boundaries. Now this is what's weird. If I were in England and I committed a crime in England, the English police can arrest me, yeah. right? And the English courts can convict you. Yeah, I mean, unless I have diplomatic immunity, like that piece of crap that just murdered, uh, ran over a kid in England and then fled back here to the United States. Oh, I didn't hear about that. Oh, yeah. They released her name, too. I I should look that up. But um, so let's say diplomatic immunity aside, if you commit a crime in another country, you are you're going to be held accountable in their criminal justice system. We have a whole show there in America called uh, Almost Got Away With It. But that's not the case on tribal land. No. On tribal land, if I get pulled over because I'm not a member of the tribe, they can't even ticket you. No, all they can do is hold me there and call a deputy from whatever county, I guess, is the nearest county. Yeah. Yeah. I keep thinking I'm hearing a noise. No. Uh, we were just starting to talk about uh, people being pulled over on tribal land. Yeah. Okay, so sorry about the uh, interruption, folks. Technical difficulties. Yeah. We were, so we were talking about the... Almost 6,000 missing Native American women on uh, throughout the country, but they all, they're all they all missing um, from tribal land areas. Right. And tribal land, basically, they have no authority, unless you're a member of the tribe. Well, and like you said, it's an extremely understaffed police department. The resources are probably just as, um, you know, minimal. I guess they don't even have enough 
of the basic, you know, um, they don't have like a CSI department to go investigate a murder. Yeah, they they don't, and they're not overlapping to where the feds are picking up the slack, because if it's okay, it's not their federal government. It's it's a whole other sovereign nation, right? Right. And so, but they're but they're governed by the federal law enforcement. Still, in order for the feds to get involved, even in a state or local matter, it would you would have to have what they call a, like a serial killer or a um, was it a kidnapping mm-hmm. it has to be a, an actual federal crime because a local murder is not a federal right. crime. So, you know, basically, if you want to get away with murdering your wife, move to tribal land, marry a native woman, and murder her. And you're going to get away with it, and she'll end up as one of these six thousand women because nobody is investigating these crimes on these. On the, well, know. they're saying that the families are basically doing it. Yeah, they're the only people. Yeah. Like this, uh, this one woman in the story that we watched, mm-hmm. Ashley Lauren Heavy Runner. Um, her sister is is the only woman or the only person who's really you know investigating. Well, it. the family, yeah, the family, and she's. This is how crazy the whole the whole situation with that is, and nobody's in jail for it. Is that uh, Ashley was was a very pretty girl, mm-hmm. you know, apparently a good student, went to college the whole bit. Yeah, she but, was that smart student that when she got an A, was like, oh man, I only got an A. Yeah, a decent, real, you know, good person apparently, but uh, I guess watered into into some drugs. Yeah, she had, you know, was a uh, uh, the story said that. The grandfather that raised her and a boyfriend, the love of her life, kind of died both at the same time. Yeah. Same, t- same did time. Did the boyfriend frame. die or did he just break up with her? I thought they said he died. So, anyway, she, she lost two people in her life and apparently went down the road of drug addiction, um, hardcore drug addiction, I yeah. guess. It would have been meth, according to one of the guys that she had. Well, and that's was staying with, and this guy was like fifty years old. Yeah, and she was twenty five or twenty. And he looked like you know a bag of dog shit. You know, just, I mean, sorry, you know, dude, you, uh, that guy looked like crap. You know, I'm not disagreeing. He, and 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 to be fifty years old on top of that, yeah, you, the yeah. attraction was drugs. There's no way. In, well, he even says that in yeah. the in the article. Oh, I know. He quotes Dwight Yoakam, and he's a guy's a nut, but. uh but I don't know if he's a killer or not because there's he, according to him he drove her to this out I don't know out of the way location or to me or a meeting point let's just say right, because everything she's... out where they're at looks like it's out of the way right. so let's say but to them it's like a normal drive right so yeah let's say a meeting point off of some highway Oops. and uh, <laughs> no worries and so he he gets there and he nods off but he's supposed to be dropping her there to some guy named V Dog is going to pick her up V Dog is a a guy named Paul Valenzuela now supposedly this dude falls asleep wakes back up she's gone and he just assumes that oh they the guy must have came picked her up and that was it and if his reason for passing out was that they had been on uh been up for two and a half days basically doing drugs so he just crashed out and that's that's possible. That's very possible. It's possible now. V Dog has a wife named uh, T Eastwood, and uh, every, there have been rumors around that town that she actually murdered Ashley, and uh, and V Dog, her her husband Paul Valenzuela, actually you know said some things in a text to to Ashley's sister that oh you know T knows more than she's saying kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he also tried to tell or uh, extort the news team that was reporting yeah, on yeah. this. You know, I'll so, talk to you if you get me moved to a different location. Exactly. He wanted to go to another prison, and then he was going to talk. And he said, "Yeah, they quote unquote, I'm the only one who knows." Yeah. Well, isn't that an admission of guilt? You have a missing person, and somebody says, "I'm the only one who knows." To me, that's like an admission of guilt. Right. Oh well, if you know where she is, then right. Tell me where the fuck she is. Yeah, and and T Eastwood actually recorded uh, a video, which I didn't see the video, but I heard the audio from that video. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where they maybe legally couldn't show the video because it was done. Ill- it's basically it was an illegal recording. Huh. And they said it was had been taken down since, but she basically says. That Paul, you know, V-Dog, knows where Ashley is, and uh, and he's the only one that knows, and it's really incriminating. She's basically saying that he's got her, he's holding her somewhere kind of thing. Even though he's in prison or jail or... 
Yeah, he's on prison for a, a separate offense, uh, weapons... Illegal weapons possession. Because well, he's probably a convict, and convicts aren't supposed to have weapons, right? Probably. The, we're, we're speculating with that. We don't know the fact, you know, good... Well, they said he had prior drug arrests. And that makes sense. Yeah. So, that's, um, that's some really disturbing shit. We understand that, uh, God, I, it, it makes me think of, um... You know, if you do the math, it was like 3% of the women have been reported missing. That's just pathetic. It, it makes me think of the Grim Sleeper in Los Angeles. Yeah. Grim Sleeper got away with murdering African-American women uh, in, you know, Los Angeles area and the poor areas for over 20 years before finally being apprehended through, like, his son's DNA kind of thing. You know, it was the, the uh, what do you call it, the... Uh... Kind of like the Golden State Killer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And so it just shows that, you know... If, 23 and me basically caught, caught him. Yeah. The police don't really... Um, let's just say it. The police just don't seem to investigate the murder of minority women. Well... In, in a lot of communities. I'm not going to say I mean, every community, but in, in my book, it talks about the uh, the, the Oak uh, Park rapists. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and the cops knew him. He he was yeah. there at the very first body that was discovered. He was the guy who had access and discovered the body. Yeah. And they knew him, and it took them over a year to arrest him. He had, he had a, he was the only one who had access to all the homes where all the bodies were found, and it took them over a well, year. Even in the even in the article that we watched, the I don't know if he was the brother of of the girl or not, but he was one of the the indigenous guys from. The tribal land said, uh, "If a white person gets kidnapped, they're on it within hours. Yeah. If an, a, uh, uh, a native a native gets, they, they don't care." Indigenous, they, you're you're absolutely right. It's, uh-huh. And it's not just that. It's yeah. This is I mean, um, six two hundred out of six thousand. Six thousand is absurd. And so, if there's six thousand missing women, I mean, I'm. Betting at least three thousand of them are dead. Uh, I feel like it's probably, probably higher. more. Yeah, probably a lot more. I was, you know, I, 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 and to go back to my TV reference earlier was I watched the first forty eight a lot, and I know if they haven't shown up in forty eight hours, that's not a good sign. Exactly. Now, um, over to uh, there had been a rally at the uh, at the at the state Capi- capital, state capital, to recall uh, Governor Newsom, right? So the, one of the uh, one of the reasons one of the people had mentioned uh, one of the big reasons people are very upset besides the fact that this state is getting too expensive for everybody to be, any to be able to live here. Right. The homeless crisis is exploding, and Gavin Newsom is not sending anybody any prisoners to uh, death. You know because he's basically put a moratorium on the death penalties. Mm-hmm. He's not going to send any at all. Um, in a way, he's breaking the state law. I mean, you know, the, the people of California voted for the death penalty, as, you know, this, this person on television said, and, uh, and it should be carried out to the letter of the law. But this governor's decided to put his feelings about the death penalty above the law. Mm-hmm. To me, I, I think they have a valid point with that. Not to mention the, the homeless issue, which I don't know, and that's a huge issue that, that, took a long time to create and I don't expect him to fix it overnight but he he could be talking about it more at least I also feel like you're there I get the point about death penalty I'm pro death penalty yeah me too. Um, but the thing with the home you can't blame the homeless situation on a guy who's been governor for 15 minutes yeah no I I, I, in, I, don't I know, understand it's been a that year, I guess maybe he was elected I, th- I think he he needs to talk about it a lot more and, and maybe get some uh, some plans uh, something going federal funding whatever but um but yeah, that but you got to remember that his 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 connections to Washington aren't so great with him suing the current president oh yeah and, and any chance he gets so trying to get anything federal no, he's done, not going to get any money he's not going to get this administration anything from this administration no way. no way so well good luck with that the last uh the last governor that, or the only governor i think we ever recalled was gray davis oh. And that, that was Gray Davis wanted to give um, driver's licenses to, to illegal aliens. 
basically. Is that the way we? Is that why we? To me, to, for me, that was the, like the real hot ticket thing that I remember them writing in the press. You know that that whole yeah. thing in the press, and that really got under a lot of people's skin. You know, it did seem kind of absurd that you're in the country illegally, but you can go to DMV and get a license. Um, it's 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 a, yeah. It doesn't really make sense. I mean, I'm not against immigration. Why not just make it a little an easier process for them to be able to get, you know, a green card or or even citizenship. Uh, I think if you can get a green card for and be a good citizen for five years or whatever, absolutely. set a standard, then say okay, now you can apply to be a citizen or be a citizen. Absolutely, I think it gives them something. You know, it gives people. It's fair. Yeah, and it. Uh, and it's safer too, because otherwise you have basically lawlessness. Because if you're not, you know, if you're right. driving le- illegally anyway, you and, it, and that's the thing too is if you think about it that way. If, let's say you have a husband and a wife, and let's say three teenage kids who are all coming over here to get green cards. Yeah. Eventually, they're all going to have to pay to get a license. Yeah. They're all going to have to pay to get insurance. They're all going to have to pay to. So it's, it's good like, for the economy. It's good for the economy to let Absolutely. them do that. No, oh, that's a great point. I guess um I don't think it's gonna happen though. No. I feel like I feel like uh Slucky Boy Gavin has a little bit too much stroke in the state to be being a democratic state, being governed by a Democrat. Yeah. We shall I don't think he's going anywhere. I don't I don't see the this movement being um <clears throat> This movement's as, not big enough. No, as strong as the other one. And the other thing really got strong when people thought that Arnold might be interested in because everybody loves Arnold. So, you know. Arnold has no desire to be governor again. No. Um, He's back to making movies and lots of money. Yep. Yep. And, and a lot, of, lot less headaches. So <clears throat> we want to talk now about um, a man who's turning out to be the most prolific serial killer in United States history. <sighs> Which is uh, no small feat. 90, 93 women? 93 women he's claiming, and the federal government is saying that he's credible. The FBI says it, they're credible confessions. Mm-hmm. He seems to have um, a great memory. He's able to draw these women out. He's able to recall them. And now they've posted his confessions online for people to be able to watch. I watched a, what did I say, about 14 minute or 14 and a half minute video where it was... Uh, like, again, I think it was Baton Rouge was one of the cities. Baton Rouge, tell me about, insert woman's name here, describing her. She was 5'6". She was 135 yeah. pounds. She had a bob cut. Uh, he tells the story about how we met him, uh, what he did with him. Uh, and it's he does it all with a smile. He does it all chuckling. It's That's what's really sinister about yeah. it is the fact that he's laughing while he tells it. I only saw... a. A two or three minute clip. No, he know. is. And again, that's not even. The, it was probably only ten women he talked about in the video that I saw. But it is he, chilling, he could, to he, say the least. You could tell he was reliving the moment, you know, with glee. Oh, it, he with glee it, as he as he, he he literally had like a a, a like a sparkle in his oh, eye yeah. while he was talking about them, yeah. and he he. It's weird because. I think the U.S. said most serial killers have like a very certain type, blonde, 5'5", 115 pounds. His were all women and transsexuals. Wow. There was, in one of the things, it was a 19-year-old transsexual uh, in, I want to say, outside of Miami-Dade area. Yeah. That was 19 years old. Was really tall but really thin, like I want to say five nine, but one hundred and fifteen pounds. And it was, what'd you do with her? Where'd you put her? Like a mile outside of town on whatever highway in this, uh, like uh, marshy area. It just. Well, they they asked him how he felt while he was killing this one woman, and he said, the thought, the the fact that she was struggling for it fighting for her life while he was fighting for his pleasure and like you said he said it with a smile mm-hmm. and a glint in his eye like like he was reliving it like he was really excited horrific it's like the only way i can compare it is when you 
like watch old baseball players, yeah. like the guys from like the Willie Mays type yeah, guys. Where well, they're talking about hitting that home run, and they had this, and they're and they're twenty years old again, or exactly 20, reliving the had, glory yeah, days. He was reliving his glory that's exactly days. Exactly what, it, and that's what's terrifying. You mm-hmm. know, I you remember you remember Silence of the Lambs, right? Yeah, everybody thought that movie was scary. That ain't scary compared to this. No, you watch this, and this is this is terrifying. That this guy is uh this guy's a real monster. I'll tell you right now, and I don't think I said it earlier, but I thought it earlier was, oh, this will be a movie uh, in two years. I'm sure. What I what I find in another interesting thing, and I think we talked about this in a in a very early episode, was because uh, when the first time we talked about him yeah. was middle of last season when this all kind of broke. Yep. And it's basically taken him this long to be like, yeah, he's telling the truth about all 93. Well, in the pictures that he's drawn. Oh, and we, like to a T. Yeah. And we were, t- we were, t- I were, I was bringing up before about, um, about Otis Tool and, uh, and Henry Lee Lucas. And they were, they, the Otis Tool's infamous for having killed Adam Walsh, but Henry Lee Lucas confessed to something like 500 or 600 murders. Maybe it was 800 murders or some ridiculous amount over like a six-year span where him and Otis Toole traveled together across the country and murdered all these people. And what that turned out to be was Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole playing the authorities right. for things like, you know, better treatment, better food, transfers to a different prison kind of thing. Better prisons. Avoiding the death penalty right. by keeping yourself in, on a perpetual trial somewhere in the country. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it turned out that it was all false. the major- or well, the majority, not all of it, yeah, yeah. but the majority of it was bullshit. Otis oh, oh, Tool really did kill Adam Walsh, and Henry Lee Lucas did really kill several women, but um, including I think his own mother. But it wasn't to the you know six hundred that he had, had confessed to. What it got to the point where back then anyway, you're talking about um, unfortunately a pretty irresponsible time in law enforcement history too. This well, is the seventies. And people were looking to solve crimes. And so if they had a crime that had been sitting around and it fit this guy's M.O., this guy's M.O. was that they raped and murdered women mostly, sometimes entire families, but mostly they targeted women. So all of a sudden this guy's arrested. He's he's big news. He's in the papers. And they've got an unsolved crime about, oh, here's a girl's body we found, you know, in the woods that was completely nude, you know, with nothing but orange socks on. Well, they go... Henry and they'd be like, "You remember a girl with orange socks?" He'd be like, "Oh yeah, oh orange socks, I remember. Yeah, mm-hmm. I really remember those. Or- you know, and they were feeding him information basically. And so it turned out that the vast majority of the things he confessed to it was all bullshit. It was it was BS. He was playing the authorities because I mean, th- these guys are are murderers. Of course, they're gonna lie too. I mean, lying is kind of a joke compared to what they've done, right? So it's the <sighs> To, to think that you could trust the word of a, of a killer, no. Well, yeah, you can't. So, you could trust that this guy's dangerous. <clears throat> and he's basically been in and out of prison, too, because they they showed this timeline of, of photos from him from 1970 to 2005 when he committed all these crimes. And to me, it looked like he was arrested, like, every year. Yeah, they, they had, a, like, a... A picture of him looked like a mugshot, well, he, he, like every other year. He told year. the story that when he was, um, he was in, I think it was somewhere in Florida, that him and this, uh, it was a, one he said he loved the most. It was a bigger uh, African American woman that they were um, like she had like a troop of thieves that they all lived together, okay. like pick a pop, pop hustlers, pick, yeah. pick grifters, yeah. And uh, they were, um, they got caught in, and maybe he said Coles, I think is what he said. But his car was left in like the parking lot of uh, East Coast Grocery Store. Yeah. And the manager of the grocery store called the sheriffs, it's 1970s, yeah. and said, hey, you need to let this guy out so he can go take his car and the crack whore that's sleeping in it, get him, get it off my property. And he goes, and then uh, I went and killed her and whatever. The seventies, just terrible. So, if you're so inclined to watch anything that horrific, um, I mean, did you ever watch the Iceman Confessions? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a long time ago. Those came out, and uh, Iceman was it was a, a a mafia hitman, yeah. right? But his his shit was just as matter of fact too, <clears throat> and you could see him getting the same glint in his eye when he was talking about poisoning guys, especially mm-hmm. you know some of the weird stuff. Well, he got off on them. Yeah, the death of them, watching them die. Yeah, he totally. You know, don't ever. He wouldn't. The worst thing to do would be have lunch with you know with uh, what's this Kolkinski. <laughs> Kuklinski. Yeah, something like that. Richard Kuklinski, right? Because yeah, as soon as you turn your head, he dumps cyanide all over your sandwich, yeah. in your coffee, in your soup, whatever you got. I think he confessed to, to like dressing up like a woman, going into a, a gay bar kind of thing, and like, you know, almost like Divine type character because he was a big dude. Yeah. And like dancing his way over to a floor and, and nailing somebody with a needle, you yeah. know, the, you know, and killing him kind of shit. Um, Crazy, crazy type stuff makes you think half of it was bullshit, but he was the real deal too. Oh, I think, and he what he confessed to like forty murders. Yeah, and I think they convicted him on like thirty eight. He he said he what he he'd kill a guy and then he'd go home and and put his kids' toys together for Christmas morning kind yeah. of thing. You know, for him it literally was business, but he he was a serial killer. No, I mean he, just because he's a mafia hitman doesn't oh, he was make still him a serial killer. Yeah, totally. And uh, now. The difference is uh, is Richard killed a lot of guys, mostly. Well, he um, also killed a lot of bad people. Yeah, so that you know, he was, uh, it was business, right? It was you know that was the life that he was in. This guy is your classic uh, lady killer, female, pr- you know, oh, yeah. predator, and like you said, hustler too. It seems like he's he's been in uh, in trouble with the law almost every year, every other year, and he never really had a job. So what, I don't think was he a pimp. I they, need to read more into this. No, they they were saying he was. They in a different article they said he was like a like a a journeyman uh, handyman or something like something to that effect. He's just like the Oak Park guy. And it's like okay, so he basically was just a guy who could sling a hammer. But he traveled. It seemed to me to me didn't, a, weren't his victims all over the place or they were. Oh yeah. Yeah, so it wasn't like he was killing all these women in one state or in one town, like the Green River Killer, where eventually the authorities would catch on to him. I want to know. Okay, this is where I. Feel. He went everywhere. He it's. I, how, how did he start confessing to all these? Like what? What? What was the magic? You know? See, that's the part I don't think. I mean, I think we talked about it because we've talked about him in the yeah. previous show, so I don't remember the. The episode, and we probably have to go cert- redo our research to see which yeah. which is which. But it's it's one of those things where uh, I want to say it's because he is in L.A. County, yeah. and he can he ended up confessing to doing something else in L.A. And maybe because he's it was so old. One of those. No, I thought again we'd have to go back so, and watch the old or, or the yeah. other episode. I'm going to do a little more research on, on him yeah. again. Again, this stuff kind of all just broke today. Well, he's, he's 80 years old, right? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a... Uh, but he looks in, I mean, he looks in good shape. He looks creepy, too. You already call it, especially, you know, like you said, that glint in his eyes. You know, he's a he, creepy dude. And uh, another thing, I guess, the... We spoke about this too in other episodes, or the other episode about this guy. I think was the fact that there aren't a lot of famous uh, African American serial killers. You know, I guess the 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 sniper, that was the, the one in Washington yeah. D.C. Yeah. Uh, okay, so him you, and his son. So you have one or two, two, I guess there. A duo. Um, and that's relatively recent. Yeah, that was early two thousands. And then you have what the Atlanta child killer. Yeah. Okay. And then I'm trying to think of another. And I, I I can I know there are at least two that I can't think of by name right now, but they're not like infamous. Well, there was there is yeah because we talked about the other guy that was also in L.A. Well, County. Oh yeah. Well, the, uh, just the guy in the book in the book from around here from uh, Oak Park, the oh. Oak, Oak Park rapist. I forgot about him too. So there are more than. Than we think, you know. I, I bought a book. Well, I think I think it falls into that category that uh, not all terrorists are Muslim. They're usually Caucasian. You know, it's like yeah. not every serial killer 
is white. Some of yeah. them are African American, but yeah. uh, the majority of serial killers seem to be Caucasian. Yeah. Well, and you, but that going back to the now I'm going to bounce back to the the six thousand missing Native American women. Is that only because crimes against non-white women just go uninvestigated? I feel like it's. It's two things. Yes, it is that. That people, if you're not Caucasian, it doesn't get reported yeah. or it doesn't get investigated. Yeah. And two, there is a, a a very significant drug and alcohol problem in the native people's well, lives. Yeah, there's there's always been that community. And then there's, there's always been, in any community, you go to a bad part of town, there's always going right. to be one street or one bad part of town where there's going to be some serious drug addiction and prostitution and things right. like that. And this, those are and the parts of town. that's what I can see a lot of them being put up, cut up, or, yeah. you know, be, have become high, be prostitutes in New York City and, yeah. well, and that's, foreign countries. And people just, they're just so drugged out of their minds, they don't even know what's going on. And these are the towns that, that killers like Samuel Little, you know, target. No right. matter what state he was in, he seemed to find the neighborhood where the prostitutes were. That's what he said. It was always... Yeah. It was always he was going... Because they're easy prey. Drug he's, addicts. He's not the first one to do that. Every... Oh, I hate to say, but I I think I want to... I'd, I'd bet the, about at least 50% of, of lady killer serial killers specifically target prostitutes. Maybe, maybe a lot higher percentage than that. Because... The same reason he did, because and he admits to it, because nobody would miss them. Yep. Right? No, I agree. So, I mean... And, and I think that's the problem with the, the, you know, the native or the tribal land and the the yeah. the, the Bureau of, of Indian Affairs and the, the local yeah. tribal community and then the federal government can't get their shit together You're doing, enough yeah. to let the tribes investigate stuff that happens to tribal people and give them the resources to do it. It's a compounding problem. And I guess what, what I think, you know, it's like, I'm just trying to think outside of the box. Obviously I'm not, I'm no expert on, on how to staff law enforcement, but maybe instead of having tribal police and maybe instead of having, you know, uh, I mean, keep your, your tribal government and all that type of stuff. But as far as tribal police, tribal police force, Maybe get rid of all that altogether and have a, a real department, a real branch, you know, a police force that's underneath, the, you know, the United States jurisdiction like every other police force in this country. Hear me out on this and have it staffed with nothing but, but people from the native community there. So that way you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting a professionally trained and staffed um, and, you know, with infinite resources. Right. Basically, you know, a real police force that's, that's, that's underneath federal jurisdiction. And at the same time, you're employing community members and keeping it, you know, native. Right. Well, I think, I think to be tribal on a tribal police force, yeah. you do have to be part of the tribe. Well, yeah, and I mean, that, that's what I'm saying. So that's the one piece of it you should keep. And I, the piece I think, that you don't want is the isolation. Well, I think what, I think you're, you're right, and I think what they should just do all together is, you're right, The the as far as the law enforcement part of it should go, yeah. they should all just be part of the Bureau of Indian Whatever Affairs state, law enforcement. Yeah, okay. And then they can then say, okay, the, the, the people in Montana, that tribe... You have 15 officers and a full staff, yeah. not just 15 officers. You have all the resources. And then in... You and, know, the, and the ability to send things up to the state for, for, for labs or, yeah. you know, things like that. And, yeah, to be, to be able to say, okay, we have DNA and and we needed to get it tested to see if, you know, Joe Running Bear is the one who committed this yeah, crime. And, and be able to utilize resources that, that just probably aren't available to a, a local tribal police. And I just think the, the problem is is that uh, the, the indigenous people of this country have not been treated fairly and still aren't. Well, no kidding. But it's... Oh, boy, can you folks hear that? It's all, you know... I don't know to, to me, I, I'm, like I said, I'm no expert on, on this situation, but just from the higher level, it seems like you're having... Something that's not a department, especially in particular tribal police department, that's not one empowered 
as as they don't have the, the rights of as much as they should, like a normal police department would, and two, they're not going to have the funding or or the expertise or the infinite resources. So why not just uh, get rid of that? Make all those make all those tribal police members of whatever the local police department is. Mm. You but know. just let them run the yeah the part yeah that's it this is your town or your you know your nation whatever you guys run it but it's still you know uh, part of Montana law enforcement and therefore you guys have access to all the resources we do yeah. and at the same time ultimately you also fall underneath the same jurisdiction that way every one of your officers has the right to pull somebody over right. and investigate them for a crime and arrest them for a crime yeah uh, it's it, yeah, I think it would be a better situation, and they probably have better retirement too. So, yeah, it would probably be a lot better off. Oops. I don't even know where some of my phones around here it's somewhere. Right there by your hand. Uh, the, <laughs> I've been having to get up because of the equipment stuff that we've had. Uh, so far back, this is our our uh, most technical difficulty show. Yeah, well, we. You know, uh, audio cable goes bad on you in the middle of it, and then the camera wants to turn off. But um, hey, at least the dogs haven't barked. No, they haven't, thankfully. So we started talking about the uh, the Amber Geiger case and right. the uh, the murder of Joshua Brown, <clears throat> and how everybody jumped to conclusions on that, and it turns out to be was a drug deal gone drug wrong. Drug deal gone wrong, and they've already got one guy in custody, and two on the on the run. Yep. And then uh, we spoke about the six thousand missing uh, Native American so, women, yeah. which is. Still, just a number that I can't it's, get. It's can't so get unbelievable. Six. How did you let the let it get to that point, and nobody's investigating, and and nobody's. I mean, I hear all the time, cold case solved. Hell, they, they got the Golden State Killer, right? right. You know, this guy, um, Little, right? Yeah. You know, cold case, cold case, cold case. You got six thousand cases growing real cold. Yeah. You know, and nobody's. In a, what was they say? Was it a thirty-year time span? Wow. And nobody's investigating so him. 200 women a year. Terrible. That's four women a week. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is, uh, the, the Ashley Lauren heavy runner case that's in, uh, Blackfeet nation, Montana, but this number is nationwide, right? Right. It's, it's the national. Yeah. And less than 200 of these 6,000 are in the national missing persons database. Well, that needs to be corrected. I mean, it, so we we understand that information is true now. What's it going to take in order to get those six thousand? Yeah, get, get, I mean it. It probably take a while. That it's a lot of data entry, but I'm sure we could do it. Yeah, in today's day and age, it's probably five minutes per name. Just uh, absolutely absurd. Somebody you know needs to. Uh, you well, get, somebody besides the families needs to to get up and start doing something about this. There's this thing called interns. 20 of them a day, you know, or to get 20 of them to work on it for a week. Yep. You know, well, they could do 12 an hour. Totally. Totally. Well, I think that's enough gore and uh, blood and... Call this murder. one a day. Yeah. I guess technically now it's a night. We're making up for the last... The last episode was a little light on the uh, on the murder. And, so we just went full. So we're going full into it this one for you. So anyways, um, we'll see you next time on another episode of Season 1 Podcast. Thanks for watching.